Hey, Howard from 82 Maple. And remember those sci-fi movies that had us all terrified about what was going to happen when the robots took over? Well, you know what? We're living it. We're living it every day. It's here. You know, my dad, despite working 10 hours a day and always having a home building project going on the side, was one of the greatest teachers ever. He was totally transparent about his day, about what was going on, about his projects, what the problems were, and how he solved them. And one of the things that I remember him repeating to me well into my adult life was, Howard, remember, you own your possessions and not the other way around. Well, Dad, sorry, but it seems that I've had a lot of situations crop up recently where my possessions are owning me. Hey, if you've been on this channel over the last very few weeks, we've had a less than two-year-old cantilever gate failure, which locked us onto our property and took more than an hour to resolve. Uh, the John Deere 4066 in here went into the dealership for, count them, the fifth visit in two and a half years and the third one for a diesel exhaust system malfunction. And what else did we have going on? Oh yeah, you can see, it's snowy, it's cold, it's winter. When does one depend on a fireplace? Well, we've got that propane a fireplace and the remote control failed after two years and appallingly the distributor says we can expect it to fail at least once a year and be replaced at least once a year. So one of your fellow viewers categorized this phenomenon as de-engineering, meaning that all the things that we've been doing to improve our lives have, have resulted in a level of complexity that's now frustrating us and costing us financially. So we're gonna talk about de-engineering and what it means to be a property owner, an equipment owner, a vehicle owner in this era of de-engineering. But hey, you know what? To lighten some very dreary, uh, perhaps, perspectives on de-engineering, be sure to check the comments section below. I've put in a link uh, about a relatively new hobby farmer and his perspectives. You'll definitely want to check out that link. Uh, now, stay tuned for the rest of the story. Okay, so we're going to talk about what has me taking a relatively new piece of equipment back to the dealership repeatedly. But before we get into that, back to the viewer comment about de-engineering. Here's what he actually said in response to one of the episodes in this series about the price is not the price. And I quote, I call this de-engineering. Dealers used to make their money on equipment sales, but now it's in maintenance and repairs. I drive a lot of Toyota vehicles from the 90s for just this reason. Plus, this newer technology requires special tools and computers anything to shut down backyard mechanics. Wow, that's a pet peeve of mine. He goes on, also manufacturers try to push legislation that prevents the equipment owner from doing their own repairs. We, lots on YouTube on that. You can chase that down separately. It's like we as a society are being de-engineered. Things breaking constantly. A person would think with all this technology, we could make a million mile vehicle. And we can, but there's no money in that for the manufacturer. End of comment. You know, all great points. I love that. De-engineering describes it perfectly. Uh, I think that this viewer and I are on the same page with regard to North American manufacturer. Okay, so an example. You know, we had a little issue with this Ford F-350 a few months back when it, was, when it wasn't snowing. We hooked up Coral's horse trailer and headed for a horse event over in Kamloops. It had, the unit had about 100,000 kilometers, which is about 62 or 63,000 miles on it. 
and we get on the road and guess what? We get the dreaded diesel exhaust fluid error message saying that it was going to go into shutdown mode at some point. We limped into the campsite. I managed to book an appointment with a dealership about an hour away. It literally was on its last legs limping into the dealership and uh, on a Saturday, a senior diesel tech, big credit to the dealership, uh, came out on a Saturday to diagnose the unit, told me in advance, uh, I think it's a sensor problem, uh, which it later turned out to be, but now I'm getting ahead of myself. And he said, Howard, if it's a sensor issue, we have no equipment as a Ford dealer to tell us which of four sensors might be faulty. And as long as there's a faulty sensor, basically I had an unrunnable unit. It was in idle mode. So you know how that works. And he said, our only way of going about this is to change out one sensor at a time. I gotta let you know the sensors are $800 Canadian with taxes. There's about $400 labor involved. And so we cross our fingers, but that's full disclosure. So we got into it and I lucked out. The sun, the moon, the stars, everything was aligned. The first sensor we came to was the faulty sensor. I left. $1,200 later, but had a great conversation during the road test with this senior diesel tech, again, over 12 years as a Ford diesel tech, and said, what would you do if you were me? He said, Howard, I can't tell you officially, but I have a 2017 unit and I pulled the uh, DEF system out of it. Uh, so $3,000 later, that is exactly what I did, pulled it out. And uh, so when we think about it, uh, this diesel exhaust emissions is supposed to reduce emissions. Well, there was just one extra trip I had to make to and from a dealership to purportedly reduce emissions, but that's only the beginning. We'll touch on that a little bit more. Here's the bottom line. We've got a little 20 acre hobby farm and yes, we have chickens and we have eggs and we're going to be getting cattle and we have other activities to generate some revenue here while we're having all of this fun, but as I review my equipment purchases, there is no way with the cost of equipment, maintenance and upkeep, forget about the capital cost, that I could cost justify the equipment that we have. There's just no way. With every piece of equipment, there comes a long tail of future necessary expenditures. Hey, you know what? I hope you don't mind me referring to my notes as we go through this. I want to keep this as clear and concise as possible while not missing uh, any of the relevant details. And while I'm only referencing three or four specific examples in this particular episode, I have at least eight more that I could be talking about we're going to save those for another day at another time. Uh, so I told you we'd talk about the 4066 John Deere. And when it comes to emissions, it has the stock John Deere regen system. And at 568 hours, 568 hours it would not regen below 55%. It's supposed to go down to zero. And at 90%, it basically shuts off. Um, so off to the dealer, and uh, then at 970 hours, it had hit, I think, 80 or 85% in terms of soot, as they call it on the dashboard readout. So it was going to regen soon, and the problem is, if you're in the middle of a project, uh, and it automatically goes into regen, which is one of two options you have, automatic or manual, uh, you're shut down for 45 minutes. It doesn't matter what you're doing. You've got to let it cycle through and that takes 45 minutes. So I try and catch it before that. And I went to do a manual regen, not a chance. Phoned the dealer. They thought it might be a $2,000 part. Loaded up onto the flat deck, head for town. Uh, got it into the shop. Of course, it's a couple of days before they can get at it. I'm not their only customer. They check it out and it was a computer setting gone awry. They needed to reboot the system, so no parts required, and I was back on the road. Hey, I'm 30 minutes doorstep to doorstep from the, the John Deere dealer, and I can't say enough good about them. They get a five out of five or a 10 out of 10, whatever it is, all day long. But back to the issue, what if I was four, five, or six hours out of town? 
that would have shot the better part of two days just because the computer system needed a reboot. This is a long way from my dad's time where if a person made it, a person can fix it. The last point that I just wanted to mention is the John Deere dealer said there's literally no override. When it shuts down at about that 90% level, he said, Howard, we've had customers that had to have their tractor, like yours, winched onto the back of a flat deck, brought into town, winched off the flat deck so that we can get it into the shop to work on it. Simply no workaround. Now, my point is that unless we do things differently, hobby farming or hobbyist sawmilling can become an extremely expensive venture. I've had a number of equipment failures that collectively cost thousands of dollars and they have nothing to do with traditional wear and tear. You know, we've heard that old uh, joke about the farmer that wins the lottery and his friends say, well, what are you gonna do now? And he says, you know what? I'm just gonna keep right on farming until it's all gone. Well, it's no laughing matter anymore. That's, that's quickly becoming a reality. Um, and it doesn't need to be that way. You know, I mentioned Pete from just a few acres farm and uh, in a couple, a couple of videos ago, and he buys older equipment, equipment that he can repair in his shop. And I think that's just fantastic. I'm gonna paste the link in again down below to his operation. You're gonna love it. So let's contrast the, my experience with the 4066 with the 5000 series tractor, a 2007 unit that Coral and I inherited quite by accident when we purchased this property. It was in decent running order, or it appeared to be. It had over 2000 hours on it. And I took it into the dealership and the former owner of this property gave me full gave us full disclosure. He said, this has not been into the dealership since it was purchased. And in fact, we found that out to be absolutely truly the case because uh, I asked for a complete fluids change. I didn't want any surprises. Uh, so the dealership did that and said, Howard, we came across something that we haven't come across in forever. It's been 14 years since this unit was sold. Did you know it had the has the or had the original engine oil filter still on it? I said, "How do you know that?" And they said, "Well, they're coded differently. There's a different code number on them and they're a different color. They're not the usual John Deere green and I forget what it was, gray or black or something." And they said, "You just never see that." on a five-year-old piece of equipment, let alone four, uh, uh, a 14-year-old piece of equipment. And you know what? It ha I had no expectations of that, that tractor. It was kind of, uh, don't look a gift horse in the mouth. So two things. The engine oil filter was one of two little surprises. The second one was, there was nothing mechanically wrong with that unit. 14 years. Now contrast that with me having to take my 4066 in uh, for factory mandated, warranty mandated uh, filters, uh, fluid changes, etc. And let's think about this for a minute. So we have a 5000 series 14-year-old tractor that is apparently offending politicians and the populace uh, in general by not having any emissions controls on it versus a new tractor that I've had to load up five times, fuel up the old F-350, hook up the trailer, take it into town, drop it off, leave it, come back home, head back into town, pick it up, drag it back home. Again, I'm only 30 minutes. Let's say I'm three hours or five hours away. And you think about the fuel that I'm burning carrying that tractor back and forth to town, and that's only the beginning. Again, complete fluid changes because the of uh, the apparent precision of this equipment, we've got to change out all of those fluids frequently. Wow. So are we really helping the environment with all of our focus on the new engineering and the new methods? You know what? I'm loving that term, de-engineering, and the complexity that it's brought to our lives while apparently making our lives better. Um, 
So let's wrap this up. You know what? Apparently we're intent on reducing emissions. I've got nine grandchildren. I'm all over that. We're all living here on the same planet. But again, let's not lose sight of the contrast between tractor number one and tractor number two. And you have your own experiences to add to that. So progress or not, you be the judge. And Pete, at just a few acres, I'm gonna keep watching your videos. You're a huge inspiration to me. Uh, and I'm not a big fan of pulling out my wallet to support manufacturers that have full intentions of continuing to dip into that wallet for many, many years ahead. Going forward, these eight fingers and two thumbs are going to do a far better job of controlling their own destiny. And as you view the link that I pasted down below, uh, you know, it's not only my way of bringing a smile to your day, but it's not a completely inaccurate portrait of the naivety with which Coral and I came into this hobby farming experience. Again, eight fingers, two thumbs, they're a little chilly. We're going inside the shop now to work on some projects. <laughs>